Well, good day, everybody, and welcome to a particularly interesting FS Club seminar. I like to think that they're all interesting, uh, but today we're going to discuss the Belt Road Initiative. Now, before you say I've heard all about, uh, we're going to discuss it uh, from two completely different dimensions. Uh, we have here Doug McWilliams and his brother, Mike McWilliams. Hi, guys. Uh, Hi. And both Hi. of them have done the uh, amazingly arduous endurance rally. Uh, from Beijing to Paris in a Bentley S1. So they've got that perspective, but both of them are renowned experts in their fields. Doug on general economics and Mike uh, very much on energy economics. So they're going to give us a kind of a dual perspective on the road itself. Now, we couldn't do any of this without our sponsors, so I'd like to say thanks as ever to the sponsors who make this possible. Uh, you've been kind and generous in letting us range freely and widely, and we're certainly going to range widely today perhaps over 9,000 kilometers. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a discussion uh, from both Doug and Mike of approximately 25 minutes, but we've got lots of times for questions and comments. So uh, as, you're, as you're going, please, as ever, just go right ahead and uh, send us questions via the question bar on the right of your screen. So thank you very much. And if I can, I'm going to hand over uh, initially to Doug. Doug. Hello, Michael. Um, thank you so much for uh, including us and uh, inviting us to do this. Um, if you go on to the next slide, I'll explain that what we're going to try and do today is a bit of an experiment. And the great thing about doing an experiment in a talk on the web is if it doesn't work, it's pretty easy for people to switch it off. But I hope it will work. We're going to try and combine a talk about economics and the economics of the Belt and Road Initiative with a talk about what it looks like actually going there. And I'm not sure that you will ever have heard a talk combining economics with rallying before. Um, whether it works or not, we will discover. And basically what we're trying to do is cover the insights in a couple of reports. One is actually a report called From Silk Road to Silicon Road, which the CEBR, uh, my company, produced for the Chartered Institute of Building, and we released it in Beijing. And the other is a book which we wrote about our experiences on the rally and what we thought we learned about the economies that we were passing through and the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, I'm going to take the easy bit, which is the economics, and I'll talk about the economic impact the impact of coronavirus and how that's changed the numbers. And Mike's going to have the difficult bit, which is trying to say what it looked like on the ground and what that means. Now, that's just us in Beijing uh, launching the report. It um, gives, it, it, it explains what actually we think is the economic impact. Let me tell you a little bit about how we uh, estimated it. Um, a few years ago, we did quite a lot of work for the European Commission trying to work out um, how to evaluate um, the economic impact of multinational infrastructure projects. And we used that modeling methodology and we plugged it into our CBR does a world economic lead table every year where we work out where countries are in terms of their economic size and who's overtaking who and so on. And we predict out the next 15 years. We called it WELT, the World Economic League Table. So we fed it into that model. We took account of things like trade effects as well, which is quite important. We'll look out to 2040 in the analysis we did a year ago. And we were looking at eight trillion dollars of spend. Now, there's only two trillion of dollars of spend currently identified. So we're assuming that the whole thing takes flight and many more things get built into this Belt and Road Initiative. And just to give you a preview, our estimated net impacts, and this is when we did the calculation a year ago, was it would boost world GDP by seven trillion dollars per annum, which if you think about it for an eight trillion spend, is quite a good rate of return. Now, um, this isn't the first attempt to cover the world with infrastructure. Um, we've looked at a couple of other ones in history. Um, the Roman roads, of course, that we all know about. Um, actually, they were bigger. 
um, there was 80,000 kilometers in the Roman roads. If you look at what uh, the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System that was inaugurated in 1956 did to the United States, they added 64,000 kilometers of roads. Now, the, belt, the road component of Belton Road is actually smaller. Um, it is only 60,000 kilometers at this stage, but I've no doubt that more will emerge. However, of course, the thing about the Belton Road Initiative is a whole lot else as well. Uh, it's railway, it's ports, it's all sorts of other kinds of infrastructure. And it's also not just an economic project. There's a political project, too, because it is trying to ease trade as you go across. And as someone who sat at the Mongolian border uh, for five hours waiting to get through uh, can confirm anything that eases that kind of thing up makes a huge difference now the total spend if you adjust and i mean comparing with roman times is probably a little bit of a stretch anyway but we reckon it's that that we'll end up spending on the belt and road initiative between 10 and 15 times as much as either the romans or the americans who in a rough calculation spent roughly the same amount now we added in a lot more we didn't just add in the things that have been announced because clearly we were looking out as far as 2040 and um, there are new projects that get in all the time. Um, the last FS Club talk on uh, Belton Road mentioned the importance of 5G and we've included a 5G network. Um, there's a global energy interconnector which we think is likely. Now Mike is the expert on this so uh, ask him questions if you don't quite know what, what, what that involves. There's the Arctic, there's the polar route, and there are both Russian and Chinese initiatives, and we think they're going to get uh, merged at some point. It will affect Nordic countries, it will affect places like Greenland and so on. There's the Western European end, which at the moment hasn't really been invented. I mean, so far, the only two countries that have fully tied, uh, 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 tied themselves in are Greece and Italy. But it makes no sense for the railway to end in Poland or the roads to end in Russia. We're bound to get more added in as time goes on. And we think in particular that uh, the Netherlands, uh, with the huge port at Rotterdam, will uh, play a major part in this. Now, there is already an autonomous vehicle part of the Belt and Road. We didn't actually go past it, but the biggest lorry plant in the world is the Russian one, uh, Kazan, in uh, Cherny, which is between Ufa and Kazan, and Kamaz, sorry. And um, Kamaz have got quite far ahead with their, um, uh, 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 with their autonomous vehicles, and they've managed to persuade the locals to put in uh, 200 kilometers of lane specifically for autonomous vehicles uh, so that they can test, and it goes from Cherny which is between Ufa and, uh, 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 and, and Kazan, to Kazan. Um, Hyperloop, well, if the technology takes off, it seems pretty probable it will come in. Um, renewable energy and particularly uh, storage, we think are important. Um, and almost certainly we'll see something Pacific and that an American as well. Now, finally, this is all talking about the hard stuff, the physical infrastructure. But to make all this work, there's going to have to be a hell of a lot of software, a hell of a lot of academic research. And so we're expecting that at some point, there will be an academic Belt and Road Initiative that links uh, universities and scientific research and helps fit all this together. My guess is ultimately that this will become a global project and it'll become less Chinese led and much more a global project. Now, what does the study show? Well, remember, this was the estimates that were made um, a year ago before people started thinking about coronavirus. Um, we reckon that at an annual rate, the net impact on world GDP is $7 trillion. Obviously, China gets the lion's share because a lot of this starts or ends in China. And China has also got an involvement in building and it's also got an involvement in financing. Now, most of you, I suspect, will be amazed to discover 
that the country that gets the second biggest impact is a country that's not involved at all at the moment, which is the United States. But it's one of these things, if the tide goes up, all the boats moored in the harbour go up, uh, regardless of their situation and their level of involvement. And if world trade and world GDP goes up, and we reckon world GDP would be boosted by 4.2%, then it's pretty well inevitable that a share of that additional growth will go to the United States because it's so plugged into all the other economies around the world. So even if the US loses share, it will gain in absolute terms, actually gains in absolute terms slightly more than Russia does. Having driven across the Gobi Desert, we can see how Mongolia uh, is likely to be in, in percentage terms, in proportionate terms, uh, the country that has the biggest percentage boost to GDP. Mike will talk a lot more about it. It is quite interesting, though. Um, there are a lot of places in the center of the world. It's huge for Russia. It's huge, actually, for Pakistan, which is interesting. And then there are some other countries that you might be a little bit surprised about. For example, the biggest Western European country to be affected on these calculations is Denmark. And that's partly because of the impact of the polar route on Greenland, which is part of Denmark. But it's an unusual mix of different countries where the estimates suggest that um, they will be affected by quite considerable amounts. So this is quite transformational for some of these countries. Now, this is probably the single most important slide where I'm trying to cover in one slide uh, what should really be a whole new report. And hopefully we will get signed up and someone will actually uh, uh, get involved with trying to update this because we've done back of the envelope calculations just to show what we think might be the impact, but clearly um, it does. It is worthy of uh, going into greater detail. The first thing is that some projects are going to be delayed by lockdowns. The second is the world economy will undoubtedly be smaller. Now, our very rough and ready calculations for the medium term impact of the world economy in goods, and I'll come back to that in a moment, is that um, medium term, um, as a result of coronavirus, the world economy in goods will probably be about 10% smaller as we go on. In other words, we'll have lost about three years economic growth there. We think there's a bigger impact on world trade, and particularly world trade affecting China. We think world trade could be nearly 10 years of economic growth behind. And the reason that we think that is three things. One, the hit to world GDP, which would be particularly goods intensive and also quite energy intensive. The second is trade tensions between the US and China, which we think are probably going to hold back world trade. Uh, and the third is that we will see some onshoring of the supply chain um, as a result of the worries that have been imposed by people thinking how inflexible they get if you've got a supply chain that's trailing halfway around the world. So that will affect the economics of everything. Those things that haven't started, I'm sure will start later. Um, those things that are under construction will be delayed. Those things that have already been completed, they may need refinancing. And I reckon it'd be a smart move uh, to make the refinancing on reasonably preferential terms so that people that still feel incentivized to participate. There have been some stories about some quite tough negotiations. My view is that this kind of thing, one just has to accept that one's going to have to take a hit on it. Obviously, it, we are at an interesting time in terms of international relationships. And you know, there are, I think there is a certain amount of reset being applied uh, in the West to relationships with China. But I cannot see a fifth of the world economy being ignored. And I'm sure that wherever we, we end up with, it will be a world economy where we continue to engage with China and involve ourselves with China. So what all this is saying is the time scales may change, but the economic essential that we need to link the East and the West better remains. And that I think means that this will still happen, but we're now thinking it might happen 10 years later. So what we're predicting for 2040 looks more likely for 2050, not 2040. But the essence does still look to be there. And of course, at a time when um, 
most economies need a boost, infrastructure is quite an important way of boosting economy. Now, that's the end of the um, boring bit. You now get to the interesting bit, which is going across. And I have to say, um, we would never have got excited about doing this um, had the Belt and Road Initiative not been going on, and also had Mike and I not been brought up in Malaysia and always fantasized a little bit about the prospect of driving from Asia to Europe. And we had this wonderful opportunity, and Mike's going to talk about it. Next slide, please, and over to you, Mike. Right, well, thank you, Doug. Um, I'd like to take you on a journey along the Silk Road and give you our impressions of uh, the countries that we passed through as we drove about 16,000 kilometers in 36 days in the middle of last year. And uh, thank goodness we weren't trying to do that this year. I don't think we'd have got very far. Um, so the journey started at the, the Great Wall in Beijing, uh, and we are just north of Beijing. And as Doug said, we were driving a rather splendid Bentley S1. Um, so the big thing about China is the growth. I mean, the amazing pace of growth. Um, the first night of the rally, we stayed in Hohot in, in the Mongolia. And that's reputed to be growing at 25% per annum, which is phenomenal. And the, I have to say the traffic jams going into uh, Hohot tend to support that. Um, but the other thing about China is the amazing contrast. I mean, technology is everywhere. Um, mobile apps, facial recognition, uh, electronic payments. By the first day in Beijing, we were in the Hyatt Hotel trying to order a meal in the Chinese restaurant, and we were presented with an iPad to, to make our order. And I have to say, we, we struggled with that. Um, so you've got this amazing technology, um, but then you've also got the juxtaposition with the, um, uh, the old world. And you don't see it quite so much in the big cities, but once you get out in the countries, you do see um, what the old China looks like. And, and so, although it's growing very fast, it is still emerging. Um, so the photo we have here is, uh, it is at the Great Wall, it is at the start of the rally. And this is the toilet block there. Um, and one of the things is that they use facial recognition to uh, give you toilet paper, just to make sure that you don't use too much. So this sort of tremendous <laughs> contrast between the old and the new. Um, <laughs> Um, and we see this here. I mean, here we've got uh, a, a Chinese horse box. We've got a, a pony in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, it's actually stopped at a toll booth on the motorway. So quite an impressive piece of infrastructure, the, the, the motorway, and uh, a truck with a pony in the back. Um, on the right, we've got the, uh, the Great Wall. It's actually a, a restored bit of the Great Wall for tourists. Um, and the great thing about it is you can go up in a cable car and we came down in um, a, a rather exciting um, uh, sledge, uh, sl um, sledgeway system on wheels down this uh, rather exciting track. But um, now you've got this, this sort of tremendous juxtaposition between the old and the new. But I think the exciting part for us was once we got into Mongolia, as Doug explained, with, uh, with a bit of a wait to get through. Um, and I think we've got some very nice photos of Mongolia and we'd like to show those and it, it does show the sort of starting point that Mongolia has a long way to go. Um, Mongolia is obviously isolated, it's sandwiched between Russia and China, um, initially very much dependent on Russia, now very much looking towards China um, and the key industry is mining so transportation is absolutely critical for the Mongolian economy and the slides that we've got really show you the starting point. I mean, this would be a, a typical, uh, probably a B road in this country, um, possibly an A road. I'm not quite sure where we were at the time, um, but uh, and, and this is this is the car we were driving in. So the roads weren't quite suited to the car, um, but it was fun. Um, again, this is a, a, another road going up a, a hillside. Again, um, you know, this is a, a typical route from. Um, one one city to another city. Now things are changing. Um, you know there are some highways coming in. There's uh, the Eastern Highway, which is uh, a tarred road going east of uh, Ulaanbaatar. Um, the road there is a, a road direct from uh, the Chinese border at Erinhot through to Ulaanbaatar, which we could have taken if we were driving the easy way. So um, we we didn't have to take these roads, but the, the the rally that we were on took us this this way. 
and believe it or not, uh, our Bentley got up that hill. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, so just to explain it, what happens is um, the, the roads are informal and uh, someone sets off across the camel track. And then when the route gets a bit difficult in one spot, uh, you, you go around it and create another path. And eventually you get this um, huge, uh, it's not really a road, it's, it's sort of maybe four or five, six, seven or eight branches at any one time. Um, so again, driving along these roads, this, this illustrates the sort of base point that Mongolia is starting from and why it has potentially so much to gain from the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, this is moving into Kazakhstan. Now, Kazakhstan is a more developed country. The roads tend to be better. There's uh, a very robust, uh, or it was robust until recently, oil industry. Um, but also it's got huge reserves of copper, uranium, and many other minerals. So again, heavily dependent on transport. Um, and already taking advantage of the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, a lot of the energy is already transported. So there are pipelines from Kazakhstan into the West. Um, and so uh, perhaps it doesn't gain as much as some of its neighbors, um, but still there's, there's huge uh, potential for development there. Um, the photo on the left is the state capital of, of Nur Sultan, Nur, Nur Sultan which uh, used to be called Astana. And of course, that's a very modern city. And again, uh, sort of quite a lot of evidence of the, the investment of oil wealth. Um, the photo in the middle is, um, by my reckoning, it looks like a copper tailings dam. Um, and I think that's very close, very close, but possibly not part of the big Chinese backed copper mine near um, uh, Ekibastus and Pavlodar. And then on the right is uh, where a lot of uh, Kazakhstan's energy comes from, um, coal-fired coal power stations. This is probably Ekibastus, although I'm not quite sure about the chimney configuration, so I'm, I'm not absolutely confident about that. But, you know, uh, Kazakhstan really is a, um, a country on the move. Um, one of the things that surprised us driving across Kazakhstan is the, the huge areas of uh, wheat fields and Kazakhstan is actually one of the biggest wheat exporters in the world, probably uh, seven, eight, or ninth in the world. But um, it's actually only a very small part of the economy, and I think that that did surprise us when you see the the area under wheat. Um, I'd like to just take you slightly south of Kazakhstan, where we didn't go, fortunately, because we weren't that lost. Um, but Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan is interesting. It, it's number three in the relative beneficiaries of uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative. And I used to go there quite a lot in the 90s when virtually half the faces in Bishkek were of uh, Russian or Ukrainian origin. Um, going back uh, uh, last year, I found that um, probably, I mean, very few um, Western European uh, origin uh, people in Bishkek. And it's a very much facing the East now. So China has, has got a sort of big, um, influence on, on Kyrgyzstan. So it, again, that sort of explains the, the Kyrgyz benefit. So moving into Russia, this actually was our second trip. We went into Russia twice, once before Kyrgyz, uh, Kazakhstan and once after. Um, and the thing that really struck us about Russia is how modern and developed it is. I mean, if you read the press, you get the impression that everyone's uh, pretty much under permanent lockdown and the economy is faltering and um, you know no, nothing's happening. But actually, on the ground, you, you, even from Siberia, you could be in Western Europe, pretty much. Um, the, uh, you know, we've been warned about mugging, and uh, particularly for the rally, if you're driving a, a, a large Bentley, you feel that you're a bit of a target. But none of that at all. Everyone was absolutely polite. People were delighted to see us. And it really is a very buoyant economy. And I, I think we were sort of very surprised at that. And the other thing is that both Doug and I, we've been to Russia in the past, sort of 10 years ago. And certainly our, our experience at the time was a lot of the economy was under sort of mafia or gang control, um, people in uh, black leather jackets outside all the restaurants and, and, and shops. Um, this time, none of that. It, uh, it, it really is very much more open than we expected. Um, this photo is uh, St. Petersburg, again, huge development over the last 10 years with a, a modern motorway system. 
And the traffic jams that we experienced 10 years ago were nowhere to be seen. So really remarkable transformation. Um, this is some of the beauty of driving through the uh, Urals and the Altai Mountains. I think this is the, uh, sorry, the Urals in, in Russia. Um, this is the Bentley looking a little bit worse for wear and um, speckled with butterflies. We, we didn't do much for the butterfly population that day. Um, you turn your engine off when you're waiting at a level crossing in Russia. Um, otherwise, you get through half a tank of fuel. The trains are enormous. I mean, these trains, 50 to 100 wagons, um, taking, uh, I mean, you'd be stopped for sort of 10 minutes waiting for it to go past. Um, now, in Russia, obviously, a lot of the uh, rail system is used for freight transport and very little for passenger transport, so a bit unlike Western Europe. But uh, rail is very important to the, the, the transportation of goods across Russia. And the photo on the right, again, is this sort of beautiful scenery that we got a little bit blasé about. I mean, it's like driving through Switzerland, but driving for three or four days through these wonderful tree-covered mountains. Um, so it just gives you a, a feel for it. Um, into, into Western Europe, um, I think our feeling was that uh, it, it was, in many ways, it's a release to get into Europe. I mean, at that point, you felt that if something went wrong with the car, we could still get to Paris. We could fly in parts. We could, um, uh, um, there wouldn't be a problem with visas. Um, more things would be available. Mike, could we just go back one, one slide? Um, so, but there was a feeling about everything being a bit over-regulated and a bit of nanny state. I mean, for instance, you really need to tell German drivers not to drive into trees, uh, as a, the photo shows. Um, the economic forces, at the moment, Western Europe hasn't really taken up BRI, but we do think that um, if we don't adapt, uh, it will be forced on us. And, you know, we see this in the sort of British nuclear industry, where it seems unlikely that uh, we can get away without Chinese investment in the, um, uh, in, in the nuclear industry. Uh, so, and this is um, in Germany. Uh, we actually, we had a bit of a problem here. The car broke down. We had a blockage in fuel tank, a, a fuel line. And trying to explain it uh, to the German police who arrived within minutes. I mean, they were very friendly. And in fact, Doug has a, um, a police badge to show for it, but also very, very efficient. Um, so they stayed with us, uh, made sure that we got moving again. And then subsequently, having taken down the car details, the, the car insurers have been contacted. Two of them have been contacted directly by the um, uh, local either the constabulary or uh, the local council. So there's, there is great efficiency there. Um, they also issued me with a speeding fine, which uh, got home, I think, almost before I did. Uh, so, so enormously efficient, but perhaps slightly over-regulated. So we got there. And um, that's Mike being greeted by his 94-year-old mother, who had stood in the sun for two hours in the Place Vendôme in Paris. But our overall feeling is that there is already the Belt and Road Initiative is already happening on a huge scale. We got stuck behind the lorries that represented this transcontinental trade. And I think it's quite important to think that as China and Russia become much more economically aligned and depend much more on each other for trade, there's probably going to be an increasing political alignment as well that will follow. And that should worry people from the United States, for example. Um, we noticed that they're already making some progress in reducing border formalities. And you could tell the difference between those places where they've done it. For example, when you go between Kazakhstan and Russia, which are both parts of the Eurasian Economic Union, where it only takes 20 minutes to get through. Or the difference between that and going from Mongolia into Russia, where it takes five hours. So the improvement of border facilities is quite important and is an essential part of Belt and Road. We think that China still has the hunger to drive forward and drive its economy forward. We don't think that they're going to slow down. Obviously, they won't be going at the same pace as they did uh, 20 years ago when they were still not really very fully developed. Now China is much, um, uh, uh, much more highly developed uh, economy and because of that uh, the pace that you can as you get higher up the mountain the air gets quite a lot thinner uh, but China is still driving forward 
very strongly, and we think that that is going to continue. We think that Russia internally is cleaning up its act. There are issues, as we know, um, but dealing, um, I mean, we were told to take $20,000 in cash in a safe in the car uh, to buy ourselves out if we got kidnapped. And uh, we were told that previous people on the rally had had to do that. So we took the money and it was in a safe and we were very fortunate. Um, we spent a bit of it because we had to keep on getting the car repaired, but we had most of it left at the end because that kind of thing seems to be largely a thing of the past or maybe it happens on a very different scale. Anyway, um, we didn't see drunks and we didn't see petty criminals. We do look like, uh, it does look a bit different. Um, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and as Mike said, Kyrgyzstan, very much using the Belt and Road Initiative to transform their sectors. Um, obviously, coronavirus does slow this down very considerably, and it would be misleading to pretend otherwise. But our view, is that it's still gonna happen. It will just happen more slowly. And maybe the sort of things that we were thinking would happen in 2040 will happen in 2050. So that's our story. And we're delighted to take questions. And if they're difficult questions, Michael will answer them. And if they're easy questions, I'll have a go. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. And thank you, Zedjen, for uh, letting us do this. And I hope that, uh, you've got some entertainment and some knowledge out of it. Thank you very much. Well, Mike and Doug, that was absolutely excellent. I'm really delighted. Uh, we have well over 100 people on the call and the boards have uh, kind of lit up here. Uh, so I've got a few things, but just before we get going, there's a long tradition of these rallies, whether you like your Terry Thomas films or the Monte Carlo rally. Um, I recall a, a chap who wrote a book in the mid nineties called Investment Biker who followed a fairly similar path across Asia. So this tradition of uh, folks getting down and dirty um, who are economists who've taken a global view and actually seeing what it's like is wonderful and some great shots. Mm -hmm. But I've got to raise the B word. Uh, that's not Belt Road, that's not Brexit, that's the Bentley. Uh, I've got a few questions here, but could you keep it short? But anything special about the Bentley uh, that you did to take it across there? That's a Michael question, I think. Probably one for me. Uh, yeah, we spent about 18 months having the Bentley rebuilt, but we had it rebuilt as close to the original as possible. So we put um, better tires on it. And we, we actually, one of the things we put on was colonial spec suspension, which was available on the car when it was originally manufactured in 1958. Um, this toughened it up a bit. And uh, I, I say this was to allow um, the, the, the colonial uh, people to, to sort of drive around on, on the sort of roads that we were driving on. So we, we, we upgraded to colonial spec uh, suspension. We put an extra fuel tank in, which came in very useful when we hold the, um, the main fuel tank. And we put a large air filter on. But apart from that, it was largely un, unchanged. Oh, when we did reroute the exhaust pipe, which traditionally sticks out the back, and it's got a very long overhang anyway, so we had it uh, taken out the side and we got a snorkel that we could put on if we had some deep river crossings, which we, we didn't actually have to use. It is interesting. A couple of eagle eyed people have been asking exactly what you did at the back and between the safe and the and the exhaust. That's there. Anyway, on to the, uh, the, the more uh, uh, the more serious subject. Uh, we had a, a, a number of uh, fairly close uh, watchers here. Uh, Gavin Ingham Brook was uh, interested in why the impact on Germany was so comparatively low. Uh, and then oddly, uh, Jean-Yves Gresser wondered why the impact on France wasn't even listed. And both of them curious if you should be looking at the EU as a whole in your figures. Any quick thoughts on that? Uh, shall I take that one? Um, the impact in Germany is reasonable. Um, it's just that the trading mix at the moment between Germany and China is, is transforming itself very considerably. There was a point when German trade with China was really high uh, because of Chinese purchase of machine tools from Germany. That's changed dramatically now. And um, Chinese purchase of machine tools from Germany is much less. So we think that the potential impact on Germany, I mean, it's there and it's actually not that small, but it's not quite as big as for some other countries now. Um, France again is there, but again, France is at the end of the road, so to speak. So 
that's one of the reasons why the impact on France um, is a little bit less than the impact on others. We think that the European terminal will not be uh, will not be uh, Calais, uh, but we think that the European terminal is more likely to be Rotterdam, uh, which because we're talking mainly about freight, and Rotterdam is more of an international freight hub. Um, it's sort of a staccato question here. Uh, Joanna Hicks is asking, when when did BRI actually begin, as opposed to when did China first start planning it? <laughs> That's a very good question again, and I'm not sure I can give you a precise answer. Um, the sort of formal bits of it started emerging about six years ago, um, and but it was clearly being planned sometime, I would say between 2000 and 2010. Um, it got picked up, and I think the 11th five-year plan, if I'm not mistaken, and we're now on the 13th, so the 11th would be 05 to 010. Um, and that, I think, is probably uh, where it started sort of seeing the light of day. Um, Errol Ritz is asking, uh, in view of the consequences of the health crisis and the increasing view that supply chains will be onshored and you know, brought more either in nation or in region, uh, will the Belt Road Initiative be a valid investment and will the rest of the world be funding it or is it really just China's going to wind up funding it? Well, that that is the key question. So um, that is a very good that someone has asked that question because um, is, it, is it dead now or is it not? I mean, it's quite interesting that it's not been given quite the prominence in China's 14th plan, which is currently being uh, promulgated. Um, that it had in, in particular the 13th and also the 12th plans. Um, as I see it, um, the bits of world trade that will be less affected, there will still be trade in commodities because commodities happen where they, where they happen. So energy, oil, um, copper, metals, things like that, and things like wheat and so on. Um, they happen where they happen to be grown or where they happen to exist. You're not going to um, cut back. You're not going to suddenly get iron by digging it in Cornwall or somewhere like that. So that bit of it will only be scaled back proportionately with the scaling back in world demand. It will still happen as trade. And quite a lot of the trade that is likely to be boosted by this is trade of that kind where the goods are quite heavy and so you stick them on a railway line and uh, it doesn't matter if the line only goes at 20 or 30 miles an hour because you know you you just plan in advance and you just take it that way so that kind of stuff is still going to happen it will happen in a lower quantity i said that uh, uh, it will be uh, world trade and goods will be done by about a third which is 10 years economic growth and it will all happen later so yes but the economics of trading in goods are still going to be there. You're still going to need iron, you're still going to need metals, you're still going to need oil, you're still going to need other things that need to move around. The oil may be used much more uh, for producing plastics than in the past. And uh, there will be reusable plastics as well. But I think we're probably going to see this. Also, I think the Belt and Road Initiative will transform itself. I'm expecting that the information component will be much bigger. I'm expecting there'll be much more fiber than we previously had imagined. It's, you know, from Silk Road to Silicon Road was the title of our report. I'm also expecting that there will be some green elements. I mean, Mike is the world's expert on this. And Mike will tell you about how he sees um, a changing BRI that interconnects renewable energy sources. And one of the critical things about re renewable energy sources is the need for this interconnection. I don't know if you want to say anything more, Mike. Uh, no, I, I agree with that. I think um, the development of renewable energy projects, which is already happening. I mean, there's hydropower in Pakistan, there's uh, renewable energy in uh, Kazakhstan. Um, so the, the, the green BRI is already happening. And then there's this interconnection between uh, Asia and Europe that's, that, and, and Africa that's planned. So a completely sort of integrated uh, landmass from Africa, uh, Europe, right the way through Central Asia to to China and, and possibly beyond. Um, so yes, I think there'll be much more trade in soft soft goods and, and maybe less in hard goods. 
Mike, um, we had a question here as well, though, uh, related to this. What's the what's been the impact of uh, BRI on the shift towards low carbon, uh, and also just the general carbon impact? That's both uh, uh, from Sarah and Jessica. Yeah. Well, again, as I discussed, there's, there's quite a lot of the focus now. Whereas in the early days of BRI, quite a lot of the focus was in financing um, projects that might be harder to finance using Western finance or, or international development agencies, so coal-fired power stations and that type of thing. Um, there's very much less of that going on now, so much more uh, interest in renewable energy. And of course, China is the uh, world's leading manufacturer of um, solar panels. Uh, it, it's, its battery technology is up there, probably among the most advanced in the world. So energy storage will be a, a will come out of uh, China. There's investment in hydropower, in pump storage. Um, so you know the, the, there is a lot of emphasis on the uh, the green aspects. And I think also with the introduction of um, carbon border taxes, uh, there has to be. So goods manufactured in China, if they have a tax based on the carbon component of that manufacture, um, that's going to be uh, add to their costs. So so again the internal uh, energy component of, of the export BRI, I suppose, it, it is important. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not just investing outside China. There is investment inside China for, for trade. And, and, and Michael, sorry, the other Michael, uh, that links in with the work that we did with you on um, the use of smart ledgers, because right, you can't yeah. really have proper carbon-based taxation unless you have smart ledgers. So um, yeah, that was the, the impact on uh, world trade. Yes, that's right. Um, just a couple other things. Uh, well, we have an expert out here, uh, Gumira Kuzakaliev, uh, who correctly identified the Kazakh town, uh, but also points out it was uh, 2013 when uh, Belt Road uh, actually uh, was announced and began. And just uh, just moving along, moving into some bit of geopolitics. Uh, quite a few people questioning that, um, and I'm going to meld together some stuff from Giles Keating, Sarah Wilson, uh, Trevor Hilder, and even Bob McDowell. Uh, basically, they're all asking, uh, Trump is uh, trying to cut China off. Uh, won't Europe have to choose either the US or China? Uh, what's what, what are your thoughts on the diplomatic tensions because of COVID-19? And uh, do you think the Co Chinese Communist Party will retain power to the 2050 that you're speaking about? That's, that's one question, is it? Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the right question to ask, and that's really central to all of this. And of course, no one knows uh, what's actually going to happen. Um, we can only have a guess, and we may be completely wrong. My sense is that China is now too big to be cut off, and I don't think will be. Um, I think the US, for the time being, are clearly taking a line. It was quite interesting. I was on the webinar last week. Uh, where there was a discussion about whether the Trump attitude to China was bipartisan or not. And the person who's tipped to be Joe Biden's national security advisor, if he gets in, uh, said that in her view, it was a bipartisan view and it was an American thing. It wasn't just a Trump thing. So that that is an interesting perspective. The US is 25% of world GDP. China at the moment is 19, possibly 20, depending on how fast they're recovering. Um, you can't really ignore either, and I think any one of them that basically says you can't trade with the other will not be able to persuade the other 50-odd percent of the world economy uh, to do that. Um, and I'm not even convinced it's in their interest to do that. We've obviously got issues over infrastructure. We've obviously got issues over Hawaii. We've obviously got issues over transfer of technology and so on. And we've obviously got issues over economic dependence. But my, I'd be amazed if we don't see some form of compromise between the US and Chinese governments. It may not happen immediately, but I think they will be forced to. If I had to guess, and Europe actually had a gun at its head and was forced to choose between China and the US, I think Europe would probably go more the way of China. Um, certainly places like Italy, and Greece are already sufficiently tied up, they would go that way. I think though the logic would be that the rest of us would. 
But let's hope that isn't the choice. And I don't actually believe it will be the choice. I think that there will be uh, a higher degree of international agreement um, because it's not really in the interest to cut out as large a proportion of the world economy as either the US or China. Well, we're running short of time, but I'm going to try and squeeze in two quick questions, if I could. Uh, the first one, uh, Dave Birch, will the US upside be constrained if Chinese digital currency begins to replace the dollar for international trade along the BRI? Uh, yeah, there will be some impact on that. I mean, it's been a great advantage to the US being able to uh, produce a currency that other people have wanted to use. It's allowed it to um, run a trade deficit that's been much bigger than would otherwise have been uh, permitted if there hadn't been an international demand for dollars. And gradually over time, that position um, will deteriorate relatively. I don't think we'll ever move to a situation where no one wants dollars, but I think it's, uh, we'll move to a point where people want um, uh, uh, other currencies as well. The euro has sort of uh, played a bit of a role. I see the euro quite a lot as a, uh, uh, as a placeholder until the renminbi becomes fully uh, 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 convertible and usable internationally. I think one of the reasons that the Chinese have supported the European economy not just being for political reasons, but to keep the euro in existence um, until the renminbi takes over from that. Uh, but that's a personal view. Um, it's uh, uh, the, the power of the dollar will diminish, but that is life. You know, the 20th century was the American century. The 21st century is in many ways the Asian century, but it's not going to be quite the same. It's not, we're not going to have the degree of domination. I mean, in the middle of the 20th century, the US produced half of world GDP. Now, when I don't think we're ever going to get back to a situation where a single country ever is that economically dominant. And um, so there will have to be a sharing of power and a sharing of the benefits of power. Well, we've got, uh, you've really lit things up and there are tons and tons of questions and comments uh, ranging from what's going to happen with uh, local infrastructures through to, you know, Chinese ambitions, how confident are you of your forecasts, questions about the level of McDonald's branches in respective countries. Uh, we, a lot of stuff here that we could cover if we had more time, but I'll end on a quick one and uh, combine two questions uh, from Yves Grasset and uh, also from Howard Ox. Basically, any date for the next rally, and if you do it, will you be doing it in a renewable energy vehicle? Um, well, that's actually quite an interesting question because we've uh, been talking to the board of one of the major producers of electric vehicles. Unfortunately, I don't think that they're in a financial situation to participate at this stage. Um, but um, there is, certainly in the 2025 rally, I'm fairly certain that there will be vehicles that are renewable Although, I mean, Mike's the expert on the technology. I think your view, Mike, is it not, is that the way to do it is you have to keep on swapping charged batteries. Is that not right, Mike? Yeah, I've been thinking about it quite a bit. And I think the only way to do it is to have swap in, swap out batteries that can be replaced. So you have a, a truck um, setting off from regional centers with a, a supply of batteries. I don't think you'd be very popular if you're in, camping in the uh, the middle of Mongolia, and you're running a, um, a, a diesel generator all night to charge your batteries up. Um, and I, I can't see it being done with uh, a solar panel on the roof either. So yes, swap in, swap out batteries. But uh, with that, it should be quite possible. Oh. Well, uh, Doug and Mike, we've overrun, uh, and I think we'd like to overrun, but we can't <laughs> do much more. I'd like to thank both of you in the uh, uh, the way that we traditionally do, which is a virtual hand clap. So uh, well done to both much. of you uh, for sticking to it. It's a really good presentation and exciting folks. The book is extremely good, and you can hear more of Mike and Doug's impressions of what is an extraordinary trip uh, by reading that. It's available on Kindle very cheaply, believe it or not, or you can pay full price. Uh, I'll leave it to you. Uh, this is not the last of our webinars, as you know. In fact, oddly, today we're having two in a row. Uh, we have one at uh, 1400 London time on climate and COVID-19 with Sean Kidney. But in the time available, all I can say is uh, Doug and Mike, extremely well done. It's been very enjoyable, and we hope perhaps we can have you back here on one of our SN Club web, FS Club webinars. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Cheers.